Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you as we worship together on this, the second Sunday of 2021. And uh, I'm sure some of you are starting to get back into routines. I know our school children have some delays before they go in. Uh, the sharp-eyed among you might notice that I'm in a slightly different setting. Um, I'm st staying with my parents at the moment. My dad is out of hospital and recovering from uh, being on chemotherapy and his uh, white blood cells have been completely wiped out and so his resistance isn't high. And during this week, Brenda was exposed to somebody who is COVID positive. And so she's isolating at home and I can't go home and uh, because we just want to be sure that, that uh, we don't pass an infection on. And, uh, and once Brenda has it, a, a, a negative test, which we're hoping for, then I'll be able to head home. And so from a different location, I still greet you with uh, the warm greeting of Christ's love and the hope of Christ. And I do pray that as we worship together this morning, we'll have a sense of God's presence and God's peace and God's love. I'm going to be starting an exciting series for the month of January. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. I do want to remind you about the scripture union notes that I talked about last week. And once again, all the details are here on the screen. I'll make sure that they're also on screen right at the end of the service. But for about 30 cents a day, you will get a reading and a short devotional and application commentary that really will help you to, to have a Bible reading habit right through the year. And I can't emphasize just how valuable and, and what a blessing this could be to you. And so I want to warmly encourage you to think about ordering one of those. You can do that. Uh, just follow the instructions that are on the screen and we'll make sure that you get your Bible reading notes. Today, as we work through our theme of, of being uh, those who grow and who don't shrink, we're going to talk about facing adversity. And our call to worship is from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who believe and are saved. Let's pray. Father, as we worship you together, we pray that you would bind our hearts together, even though we're in different homes and maybe even watching at different times, we are still your children and your family. And we pray that you would bind us together, that you would move in our hearts by your Spirit, and that we would be transformed and inspired as we worship you together. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is my 
our Father in heaven, as we look around and we see what's happening in this world, things look so crazy and so chaotic. But we know, Lord, that you are the God of order. You are the God of peace. You are the God who is with us. And so even in the midst of the strife and the strain, we know that you are God. We know that you hold the world in your hand, and we can turn to you because you are our rock, you are our fortress, you are our strong tower. You are our Redeemer, you are our strength, you are our comfort. And we praise and we worship you that you have kept us thus far, that you have carried us, that you are with us. That as this new year has dawned, you have been with us each and every second of it, even though when we have turned our back on you, you have still loved us and you still continue to love us and you will always love us. You are a great and a merciful God. And we bow our heads and we adore you and worship you, thanking you for all who you are and that you have loved us and shown us your love made real in the sending of your Son, Jesus. But Lord, we know that our sins are many. We've made promises and commitments this year already to, to do things differently. And we have failed. We have failed one another. We have failed ourselves. And we have failed you. Forgive us, Lord. Fill us, Holy Spirit, so that we can have the strength to, to do differently, that we can have the strength to try yet again. Thank you, Lord God, that you are always there with open arms, ready to take us back and accept us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that because of you, the price in full has already been paid, that we are restored, we are forgiven, we are made new. And so, our God, our Father, our Son and Holy Spirit, we worship you and we praising you, praise you, thanking you for who you are, the great and everlasting God, the God of all comfort, the God of peace, the God of mercy, our God who is holy. We worship you and we praise you, both now and forevermore. Amen. What?
Good morning, boys and girls. I'm sure you can tell what my children's address is going to be about this morning. We haven't had Sunday school for so long that I hope you remember this story. Um, it's one that is really, really relevant to where we find ourselves at the moment. I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus said, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds his house on the sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat, it, beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. All right, we're going to have a look and see what happens to our house when, when the flood waters come. Let's start with the house that's built on the sand. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. And let's see what happens when our house is built on the rock. Much better. <laughs> All right. So boys and girls, this year we need to build our house on the rock of Jesus and his love and his hope. And you will know when your foundations start to get a bit shaky, we all feel that sometimes. And so then we need to come to Jesus and pray to him. The Bible says whoever listens to his words is like a person who builds his house on the rock. So let's pray now that we'll be able to listen to Jesus this year. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you give us your word, you give us your love, and in the Bible you tell us that you will never leave us or forsake us. You are our solid rock. And so this year, when our foundation feels a bit shaky, let us remember to come to you, to listen to you, to know that we are loved and that you are with us no matter what. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our theme in January, we're talking about this idea of growing and not shrinking in 2021. And many of you enjoyed the picture that I sent out on WhatsApp last night. And as we explore this theme over the next couple of Sundays, I'm going to be addressing four critical issues. The first of them is the one that we're looking at today, and that is how do we deal with adversity? And what are our attitudes towards, towards adversity? And as we tackle this important challenge, we're going to look at the prophet Jeremiah and learn some lessons from him. Next week, I want to look at the theme that I've entitled Fear Factor, that we explore what fear does to us and how we can overcome fear in our lives. During the third week, I want to look at the importance of a disciplined mind, because a disciplined mind and how we think about things, and to some extent, our understanding of God and our understanding of theology and our understanding of suffering all comes together. And when our thoughts around these important issues are not right, then we're often ill-equipped to cope with pain and hardship 
that surrounds us. And so we're going to look at how can we have a disciplined mind and how we can think in the right way about the challenges that face us. And in the final week, I want to bring it all together in the idea of looking at how service is the power that transforms our lives. That when we begin to make our faith practical and express our faith in service of God and in service of others, that very often it's by doing that that we overcome so many of the things that bully us and confound us and push us into the corner. And to put it all together, there's an overarching verse that, that we'll keep coming back to during this month. And it's a verse written by Paul to Timothy, who was one of his young protégés. And it seems that Timothy was timid. And so Paul writes to him in his second letter. And he says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And as we consider that challenge, that, that God says, I didn't make you to be timid. I didn't make you to be a shrinker. I made you to be a grower. We're going to explore how power, how love, and how self-discipline are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us and can transform our lives. And in the challenging circumstances of 2021, I hope we'll be able to do that. Now today we're going to look at the prophet Jeremiah and adversity. And whenever I talk about Jeremiah, I always say to people, if you want to understand Jeremiah, just liken him to Sir Winston Churchill in 1935, when he was saying, there's danger going on in Nazi Germany. Hitler is a danger and everybody was ignoring him. That is what Jeremiah went through for his entire ministry. And while Sir Winston Churchill was recognized and was allowed to lead the people of Great Britain, Jeremiah was never recognized in that way. And he continued to proclaim his message under very, very difficult circumstances. And if you look at the picture that I've put on screen now, uh, this picture reflects just some of the things that Jeremiah went through. At one point, he was locked up in stocks. At another point, he was thrown into the miry pit, which has become a, a, a kind of an idiom of suffering and struggle. And then in the final picture that you see on your screen, Jeremiah is the one who wrote Lamentations, Klaag Liedere, as we say in Afrikaans, where he lamented over the destruction and the fall of Jerusalem when the Babylonians had besieged it for 18 months. And Jeremiah's journey is a journey of struggle, of heartache, and of pain. The passage that we're going to read today comes immediately after a false prophet has taken over the king's attention and is dominating the attention of, of the leadership of Israel. And he accuses Jeremiah. He accuses Jeremiah of being somebody who only brings bad news. And there was a nickname that was given to Jeremiah. And in Hebrew, that nickname was Magor Misabim, which means terror on every side. And they gave him that nickname because that's what he proclaimed. He, he proclaimed danger from Egypt, danger from the Babylonians, danger from all over. And, and so they began to mock him and ridicule him and cast him aside. But the final straw was that Pashur had... Jeremiah locked up in the stocks and the commentators suggest that at this point Jeremiah was already an old man and that this punishment would have been absolutely terrible for him. He would have endured a night of absolute agony and when Jeremiah is finally released he brings his complaint to God and that's what we're going to listen to and, and it's a powerful complaint because it, it shows us how Jeremiah wrestles through adversity. Jeremiah 20 verse 7 to 11. O Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, 
terror on every side. Report him, let's report him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he will be deceived, then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts bring you praise, glory and honour, now and forevermore. Amen. What is your AQ like? Well, I guess I need to explain myself. For many years we've known about IQ, the intelligence quotient. And many of us would love to know what our IQs are. Our teachers never told us. But for many of us, we were put in different classes depending on what our IQs were. And then recently in business, they started to talk about EQ, your emotional quotient. And this really is a reflection of how capable you are of empathizing and connecting to and relating to others. And how compassionate are you and are you able to resolve conflict and deal with those kinds of things. And then even more recently, Leadership writers have been talking about the fact that the leaders that really make a difference are people who have a very high AQ, an adversity quotient that is high, that people are able to deal with adversity constructively and positively and in that way make a difference. Now Jeremiah is a prophet who experienced great hardship and had to deal with a great deal of adversity. And as we look at his life, we get some idea of the challenges that, that he faced and how he stepped up in the midst of all, uh, all this adversity to consistently proclaim a message that would form the basis of a hope of a new covenant, the hope of what a Messiah might do, and in many ways laid the foundation for our understanding of grace and the new beginning that God would give us. There are some factors around dealing with adversity that I want to address from the story of Jeremiah. And there are just four thoughts I want to pick up very briefly. And the first is that when any of us face adversity, one of the greatest temptations, when things go wrong in our lives, when, when it becomes difficult, when the road is uphill and the pathway is muddy, when it feels like the backpack on our back is filled with rocks, one of the things that we easily do is that we become victims. We develop a victim mentality. And even Jeremiah, for a moment, falls into this trap. As the evil prophet Pashur throws him in the stocks overnight, because Jeremiah has been proclaiming God's word, Jeremiah goes to God and he says, You've deceived me. You've betrayed me. You've overpowered me. You've overwhelmed me. You caught me by surprise. I didn't expect that this was going to happen to me. I'm angry. I'm upset. I feel violated. And that's the sense of the Hebrew. I feel violated. And in this moment, Jeremiah has become a victim. He sees himself as a victim. He sees himself as, as someone who has had all his rights removed. And very often when adversity comes our way, that's what happens to us. We feel powerless. We feel disenfranchised. We feel victimized. We feel like we've been overpowered. And it leaves us angry. It leaves us upset. But what's fascinating to me is that Jeremiah doesn't stay at this place of victimhood for very long. As we work our way through this beautiful, beautiful passage, we see him come to a place of profound faith and a place of profound commitment. And he understands that he can't do anything without God, that, that God is his portion and his cup. And he expresses it so beautifully. He said, if, if I try to sulk, if I try to play the victim, if I try to sulk and, and, and moan about my fate, then God's word is like a fire that burns in my bones and I actually cannot keep it in. And when you read passages like Jeremiah 29, Je Jeremiah 30, 31, 32, and 33, you look at the fire that's in his bones, and it's a message of grace. 
It's a message of hope. It's a message of restoration. In the midst of trouble, in the midst of pain. And Jeremiah has this profound capacity to move from being a victim to understanding that God's grace, God's love is so big that we never have to feel like we are victims. The second thing that we can learn from Jeremiah is that Jeremiah has a clear understanding of the brokenness of the world. Because having started out blaming God, saying, you know, you've overpowered me and, and, and I feel violated, he then reflects on the fact that actually the problem is not God. The problem is people. The problem is a broken world. The problem is a world that mocks and ridicules. The problem is a world that gives him a nickname, Magor Misabib, terror on every side. And Jeremiah becomes really realistic about the brokenness of this world. And it's Jeremiah who, in his later prophecies, will talk about how God will take away a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And Jeremiah realizes that this world is broken. This world is imperfect. And he realizes that when things happen in a broken world, it's not necessarily for anything that he has done or even anything that God has done, but that in a broken world, broken things happen. And he begins to see the reality of that brokenness all around him. And he begins to understand that he's not a victim and that God is not to blame. But in the midst of a broken world, we will experience trouble. And Jesus offered the same warning to his disciples. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And that brings us to the third point that we need to make about Jeremiah and his approach to adversity and trouble and pain and hardship is that Jeremiah realizes that this world in its broken form is not our home. And one of the things that made everybody so mad at Jeremiah is that Jeremiah eventually began to prophesy that Jerusalem would be destroyed. It would be overrun by the Babylonians, but that God would rebuild. And for Jeremiah, that rebuilding was so much more than just the physical rebuilding of a city but the rebuilding of human beings and of humanity, when a new covenant would be written on our hearts, where when, when we would have that heart of flesh, and we wouldn't have to ask what the Lord's will is, but we would know what the Lord's will is. And you see this so beautifully unpacked in some of the later chapters in his book, as Jeremiah begins to articulate the hope of what God would do in the world through the Holy Spirit, through the church, but also, ultimately, through the life that is to come. And in, in the section that we've read, Jeremiah articulates this so powerfully when he talks about judgment and justice. And his clear understanding and his sincere hope and his confidence in the fact that the scales will be balanced, that justice will prevail, and that God sees and that God knows and that Jeremiah will not be left abandoned, and that his story will not be left unfinished. The fourth and final thing that I want to see to say about Jeremiah is that Jeremiah was able to see beauty and hope in the world. In the midst of his trouble and in the midst of his pain, he is still able to hope. And we find this most particularly in, in the section that, that we looked at today, in his expression of faith and confidence in God, that he is absolutely convinced and certain that God will deliver him, that, that the fire in his bones isn't burning for nothing. Jeremiah was able to see hope, to see God's plan, to see God's purpose. And, and in, in Jeremiah chapter 9, we see that expressed so beautifully when he writes a letter to the exiles in Babylon. Now, the people in Jerusalem thought that the future lay with them, and they believed that those Jews who had been exiled in Babylon, that they were lost, that they were forsaken, that, they, that there was absolutely no hope for them at all, because they were in a pagan land, in a pagan environment, 
and there was just no hope. They didn't have a temple, they didn't have God's law, but there was no future for them. But Jeremiah could see a future. He could see that God was at work. And we quote these verses so often from the letter that Jeremiah writes to the exiles, where he says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. But what we often neglect is to notice the verses that come before that, where Jeremiah, writing to these people in a strange land, in a strange circumstance, says, get married, have children, build homes, build businesses, flourish and prosper. Because Jeremiah is able to see beauty. Jeremiah is able to see hope in even the, mo the most mundane things, like having a family, building a home, building a career. And in these simple things, Jeremiah finds meaning and purpose and hope. And so often when we look at the problems of the world, when we look at the impact of the coronavirus, we can lose sight of what is right in front of our noses. A loving family. The precious gifts of privilege that we have. Our homes, our cars, our fridges, our stoves. We can lose sight of the simple day-to-day -day opportunities that God puts in front of us every single day. But Jeremiah sees all these things. He sees beauty and he sees hope. So let me bring all of this together. When we face adversity, like Jeremiah, the temptation for us is to become victims. To cry out, woe is me, why me? But Jeremiah doesn't stay in that place of victimhood. He recognizes that our world is broken. And that as we recognize the brokenness of our world, we realize that it's not about God and it's not about us. It's just a broken world. And that when trouble comes, we don't have to try and find a culprit or see who is to blame. Because sometimes it's simply a broken world that we live in. Thirdly, Jeremiah is so certain that this world is not our home. That there is more to come. That there is a new covenant and a heart of flesh. That there is a Messiah who will come. That we can be called God's children and have a relationship with him. And John puts it so beautifully in the prayer that Jesus prays in John 17 when he says, Now eternal life is knowing you, the Father. And that when we know God, as Jeremiah describes it in Jeremiah 31 to 33, we have eternity in our hearts. And finally, Jeremiah sees beauty and he sees hope. He sees that God is at work in the day-to-day -day blessings that we have. And so I want to suggest to you that as we face all the troubles around us, as we face the adversity around us, we need to recognize that hope needs to be belligerent. And one of the things that I say to people so often when they say to me, Theo, how is it that you have so much peace in the face of death, in the face of suffering, in the face of sorrow, how is it that you have such peace, such tranquility, such hope? And I say to them, because I have a belligerent faith, that I refuse to be bullied by pain, by trouble, by death, by frailty, by sickness or hardship. I refuse to be bullied. My hope is belligerent. My hope says that God is stronger than our pain. That love is stronger than our loss. And that as we draw near to God, as we look into the face of Jesus, as he hangs on the cross in the midst of our pain, it's like fire in our bones. It cannot be contained. And we can have hope. We can find peace. And in these troubled times, my prayer for you is that you will find this kind of belligerent hope. And I want to finish with two pictures. When I sent out my WhatsApp last night, Trina Sneddon sent me this picture that I absolutely love. Kittens walking into the room of prayer, lions walking out. This idea that when we draw near to God, we find strength, 
and hope. And yes, we can even take our complaints and our whining to God. Jeremiah does it. Jeremiah brings his complaints to God, but they don't stay complaints for long. They exit as hope and courage. And then this verse from Proverbs 24, verse 10. If you falter in trouble, how small is your strength? You see, trouble is the measure of our strength. And sadly, many of us who have proclaimed faith have lived sheltered and easy lives. And now as trouble comes, many of us have found ourselves struggling. And it's because our adversity quotient is too low. But as we journey with Jeremiah and the lessons that he offers us, I believe that we can turn adversity into a place where we can be strong and we can offer hope to the world. And I pray that we will. I While we can't hand out an offering bag today, we know that the offering is still an important part of the service. And so I want to ask you to quieten your hearts for a moment and pray this prayer with me. Just read this prayer out aloud with me. Dear Lord, you are the God of majesty and might. All we have is from you and everything goes back to you. Please use us. Our time, our talents, our treasure, for the glory of your name. Amen. As we come to the communion table, we remember that line in Psalm 23 that says, He sets before us, a, He sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And as we have tackled the theme of adversity today, it's really appropriate for us to come to the table. This table that God provides for us in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, in the midst of so much trouble and heartache, He prepares a table for us and our cup overflows and surely goodness and love will follow us all the days of our lives and we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so as we come to the table, we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after supper he took the cup and he reminded the disciples that these elements that were part of the Passover are now part of a new covenant and that as we eat and drink together we share amazingly beautifully and in faith in his body and blood in the forgiveness that he obtained for us the grace that he offers us and we are free let us join together in prayer Father God Almighty, as we come to your table, we are so grateful for the love that is revealed here, that you came into the midst of our trouble and our brokenness to find us, to heal us, to restore us and to give us strength. And we praise you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you, 
and saying together, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we don't come as we are, as we ought, but only as we are able. And we offer to you ourselves. We offer to you our challenges, our heartaches. And we offer to you our willingness to be available to you in service. And we pray that you would draw near to us even as we draw near to you. And we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to sanctify us in these gifts of bread and wine. That the bread that we break will be to us the communion of the body of Christ. The cup that we bless may be to us the communion of the blood of Christ. That as we eat and drink we may be partakers of your body and blood to our spiritual benefit and our growth in grace. And we ask you, Lord, to accept us as we offer ourselves to you. And in token of that, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We remember that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. After supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you are the Redeemer of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, as you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. I invite you to join me now and break the bread in your own home. Share, that with, share it with those that are there and then the same with the cup. As we come to the Lord's table, take and eat. The body of Christ was broken for you. And as we drink from the cup, let us be reminded that Jesus shed his blood for us, that we might be forgiven, that we might be made whole. Take and drink. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we have been fed at your table, and as we have a candle burning at the table, as we did on New Year, reminding us of those who are going through difficult times, those who are facing adversity, those who have lost loved ones, those who are not well, those who face economic challenges and emotional challenges, Lord, we offer to you our prayers. Our prayers for our world, for our country, for our church, for our loved ones, and for ourselves. We offer ourselves to you, Lord. We need you, and we cannot do this in our own strength. We turn our hearts to you, because our hope and strength and peace comes from you. We thank you for your body and blood that we have celebrated in bread and in grape juice or wine that reminds us and strengthens us, and we don't even understand how, but mysteriously as we share in this meal together, you meet us, find us, and strengthen us. And we rely on that strength, Lord. We need your grace. And we ask you, uphold us and sustain us. Be with us in this time. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
thank you for being with us this morning as we've worshipped together. If you felt a little bit challenged and stretched by this message today, uh, so have I. Just preparing this message kind of challenged me and, and uh, gave me some things to think about. But our world needs people who can face adversity, who, adversity, who have a high adversity quotient, who have the strength to face troubled times. And it's my prayer that we will have belligerent hope because Christ can into our world, into our pain, into our struggle. And when adversity thought that it had conquered, when adversity thought that it had killed God's son, he rose. He rose from the dead and overcame. And as we put our trust in him, so will we. And I don't in any one, any way want to try to trivialize the pain and hardship of our world. Not at all. We are in very difficult times, as Jeremiah was. But hope is greater than pain. Love is greater than loss. And Christ overcame death and hell and our brokenness, so that we could have life. So be belligerent in hope. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us, now and forevermore. Amen. For Pretoria North, we have Patience Maeba, who is celebrating on Tuesday the 12th, and Begeni Mabaso, who will be celebrating on Friday the 15th. And here are the birthdays for Emmanuel and Grace. On Sunday the 10th of January, Danita Dinwiddie turns 17, Danielle Miller, Halgard Miller turns 13, and Kanya Papu celebrate their birthdays. On Wednesday the 13th, Grant Free turns 17, Deline Stocks, Amber Lord turns 15, Matthew Kutsier and Michael Kutsier both turn 11. On Thursday the 14th, Kay McGlashan celebrates her birthday, and on Friday the 15th, Karen Free turns 19, and Gerardus Lewis has his birthday. And the anniversaries, on Monday the 11th, Marlene and Gerald Horn celebrate their 57th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to remember these folk as they celebrate their birthdays and anniversaries this week. We thank you that you've brought them through another year we pray that you will bless them and keep them in the year ahead and that their birthday and anniversaries this week will be truly special and memorable. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. <laughs>